for this time together. Uh, <clears throat> so um, let me explain a bit in an introduction. Then we're going to do some uh, thinking back in time a bit. And then we're going to have some interaction. You're going to have to work a little bit today. So just, you know, don't get too comfy here. No, you can get comfortable. It's okay. um, I was asked to think back on my ministry and how specifically in that time here in Morristown that the ministry, I'll use the word, interacted with the community as a whole. Am I on the right track? This is Collar, my instructor. Uh, <laughs> um, and what was that experience like? So I'm going to share some things about that, but we're not going to stay in the past. So, you know, in that way, don't just get too comfy there and kind of like, oh yeah, we're going to have lots of wonderful warm memories of things. We're not going to stay there because memories are what can become effective in the present for the future. And that's what we want to think about together more uh, concretely today too. Out of the thinking about that past, however, um, three things came clear. You know, I went to Princeton, so you always have to think in three things. <laughs> <laughs> and a poll at the end. Um, there will be no poll. The first thing is this. Every church has callings. Every church has callings. And they're unique to that church. Now, that doesn't mean there can't be similarities, of course, because churches basically do the same thing. Don't get shocked, Morristown Church, the church, you know, you haven't invented everything here. Um, there are... Um, you, there are similar things every church does. Worship, governance, education. These are all things all churches do, but they do them in different ways. The callings I'm particularly thinking about, however, are the callings to interact into the community. How the church is called into um, be a part of the community. You know, it is interesting, isn't it? The name of this church, the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. That little word, in, is very interesting to me. In. It isn't of, it isn't at, it's in. It's grounded in the community. Your being has something to do with how the community here is. You are the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. Now in the olden days, too, 
when we wanted to talk about this church, you don't see, I don't see this too much. Uh, you're more PCM uh, now, right? That's the, in the olden days, we would talk about that this was the church on the green. Remember? That's how the Presbyterian Church of Morristown was called most often. No, here's the church on the green. Even that is an interesting in the placement of the church, it matters where it is and who's around it. So you have a calling to and in this particular community that is essential to your identity. And these callings, I believe, for all churches, not just this church, but all churches, go through time. There's something about them that has lasting um, importance and value and become part of your identity as a congregation. So um, we're going to look at some of these that I've sort of sorted out for you and um, see how they're working. How the, how the calling is going, does it need to be set aside? It's okay to do that, by the way. Or does it need to be renewed? Does it need to be reshaped? Does it need to be redirected? What's going on in your hearts, minds, and spirits as you think about these callings? So every church has callings, they go through time, and every person has callings. That's the thing. Every one of you has callings into the community. In some ways, that's why you're in this particular church, I believe, because your lives have intersected with the way this church operates. The, priorities it has and the directions it has in relating into the community. Some of you are actively engaged personally, daily, weekly, monthly, whatever, in certain things. But all of you are asked to support uh, what's going on. So your lives uh, come alongside everything that's going on in the life of the church. So um, we're going to be talking about that. And then we're going to also, um, as I say, expand. And then you'll see little pads of paper there. Do you see that? And Audrey is kindly. What are these little kids about? Oh, highlighters. Oh, highlighters. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I thought they were, you know, yellow. Not these ones. Yeah. <laughs> Very fancy. Very fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I want to emphasize that each of us has callings. Some of the things we say may stir you up somehow to say, oh, I like that idea, or I don't like that idea, or I'd like to see this happen, or I'd like to help make that happen. Okay? So um, I've provided these little pieces of paper, and then I will put up a thing on the wall, and anytime you have something you want to write there or at the end, you can go and stick it up there. Okay, let's move along here to the first um, overarching calling I've sensed at the Presbyterian Church in Morris. Oh, is that the word on there? There we go. Immigration. So some of these things are things I've heard, and many are some are ones that I've seen um, of an experience. On the wall in the vestry is this plaque. I knew it was there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember the plaque. 
It's uh, to Milt Trompen. As you know, Milt Trompen was treasurer of the Morristown Church for 21 years. Think about that. 21 years. He was a formidable person, <laughs> as you may remember. Um, and um, it was just, he was, he was just a, a fantastic human being and a supporter of the whole church. Um, Milt had been in the church all of his life, really. He died when he was 92. He died the year I left the Morristown Church. Um, and um, was outstanding. He came come from a very outstanding family, church-related. And Eleanor, his wife, one time told me about Milt's father, um, Jacob Trompen. And she said, um, relating to the church, that one time he was had gone to New York to meet some refugees coming to the United States, okay? And the church was going to sponsor them. I think they may have been post-World War II in this kind of period, 1950. And um, when he got there, um, he was near the boat where the refugees were coming. <coughs> he was told they were not going to be allowed to come into the United States. I don't know why. We could surmise. But um, they weren't going to be allowed to go, come in, and they were going to be sent back. As the boat started to pull away, Jacob Trumpen, who was totally committed to sponsoring of refugees and caring for them, leapt onto the boat. <laughs> and the boat carried him along with the, dis the rejected refugees out someplace or other. Now, I, never, I don't know if the end of the story actually is that the refugees were able eventually to come and be those particular refugees sponsored, but that's not my point. My point is there were individuals who were totally committed to reaching out and welcoming strangers into our midst. That's the point, that it's there in the church's identity to have that welcoming spirit. If you go back and read history in the church, you do find about sponsoring in 1950 and 1956, refugees come from Eastern Europe. So that's post-World War II. And perhaps during the Hungarian uh, Revolution. I'm not positive about that. By the way, you've got some terrific history books still, you know, written by members. There are three that come to my mind. To celebrate John and Diane Anderson, a huge tome. Mikey uh, Knotts. Glimpses of the Green, which was done in the bicentennial year of the United States, and uh, Janet Foster's book on the uh, construction, design and construction of the current sanctuary building. <clears throat> anyway, that's a little uh, rabbit trail. So, 1950, 1956, refugees. But we can even go back farther, right? 1899, Italian mission. What's the Italian mission? Neighborhood. Neighborhood house. Women of the Presbyterian Church in Morristown were concerned about women at, who were living in that area of where Neighborhood House is now and went and formed a mission that um, taught really, I think we would say they were kind of home economics, kind of classes. They were trying to help women who had emigrated from Italy to feel more comfortable here in the United States. That was the foundation of what came to be the neighborhood house. That's you. Uh, jumping forward, in 1975, the church sponsored a 
refugee family from um, Vietnam. That family, again, was um, housed by a member of the church. That family lived with another family for many months, uh, the Nguyen family. And um, there was a committee, but it really came down to just um, Carolyn and Clark Brace, who uh, housed the Nguyen family, mom, dad, and two kids. I think one was a baby, as I remember. Fast forward to the 1980s, we did sponsor Laotian refugees. This time, they were housed. Are you remember? Anybody's remembering these sorts of things? Yes. Howard House. In Howard House. That's when Howard House on the second floor was more renovated to be a livable space, and um, um, a shower was put in. Um, that ultimately became very helpful later on, and we'll come to that. So these are all part of the DNA. These are what's going on in the church. Is in some way this stirs to say, well, how are we doing right now in welcoming the stranger, in welcoming those who are not in the center of community life? Anybody want to respond? Just talk with each other for a couple minutes here. Just go ahead. What, what do you think? Well, we've gone into the spirit, originally. Went into the spirit, the yeah. In terms of what, what's, that, what's going on. English is a second language, I think, classes have been offered. Um, support for documenting. But depending upon the politics, because the relationship. The politics of who? The church? Wind of the Spirit oh. for a, a lot of it, and then people who come and go um, in the church because they take it on as a mission. Oh, um, see, it comes to that, but some individuals. So, individuals, very important. Very important. Yeah. Others? Yeah. We also used to house, I assume there were homeless people in Howard House as well. Uh, or coming, we'll come to that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, my mind was just opened up by the concept of welcoming includes welcoming families because I was, when you initially said it, I was just narrowly thinking of welcome, welcoming to worship or as a worshiping community or opening our doors more inclusively to worship. But you're, you're actually talking about hosting in some sense. I am. I, it, it, that's what the church did, yeah. Uh, primarily. Yeah, there wasn't a big uh, emphasis. That's an interesting point, isn't it? There, there wasn't a big emphasis on, oh, you know, we got to get these folks Christianized, um, get them into worship. Uh, there was, there was, yeah. that was not a point of discussion. So that's very interesting. And that has not been part of our DNA either. Seems not to have been. Mm -hmm. Seems not to have been. Yeah. Do you feel challenged by this, or is this sort of like, yeah, this is sort of the way things are now, or what, what do you think? I feel a little guilty. Oh, really? Wow. We've done stuff. Love it. There's so much more. <laughs> <laughs> So you talk about it, I think, geez, we should do more. I, I don't know the, all of the history of immigration, but it seems like it's so much more complicated now mm -hmm. with helping um, people from other places get here. And the, the legality of it all is just overwhelming. It does drive you into difficult territories, doesn't it? I'm, I'm yeah. trying to help. Um, it's a couple who are, um, the wife is Korean and the husband is Swiss. And they are both musicians and they can't get a green card. Yeah. They're educated, they're, you know, and they can't get a green card because this is my soapbox, but in this country, we don't really value the arts. But it's just very difficult 
because of all of the red tape and government and the time it takes and it gets very frustrating. But it's very costly. Yes. <laughs> it's very costly. And we're also working with grants. Yes. Who? Grants. It's Refugee Assistance Morris Partners. We're, um, we're, it's not just our church that's doing it, but we have an Afghan family in Luton. Okay, right. And uh, we're doing ESL. Well, we're doing everything for this family. <coughs> everything for a year. Okay. And this is going to extend because of the situation of that family. It's going to be longer than a year. So it's, uh, it's complicated. It gets people really involved in all kinds of ways. The, the financial being one, but the emotional. Um, we have to ask that family to leave the house. I just, it, it got, we got a job, we got a car. The church did that uh, for him, the husband. And he quit the job within a few days. Um, it was just too hard, he said. He wasn't used to that. Well, he probably wasn't. He was probably, you know, in a more um, office management kind of position in Vietnam. Um, and this was uh, in uh, working for A&P. Remember the A&P? <laughs> uh, and loading and unloading. That was not easy work at night. So it gets us involved in very difficult things. Very well-meaning people and people in this church. You you want to help and then you get into it and you say, but there are all these roadblocks. Right, right. Well, let's, let's look at another one. This will still not get to Dick's point. So, the uh, second area was, as I thought about it, the area of health and wholeness. Every single Sunday you can look at a window and you see George Washington there in the orchard taking communion, right? So, um, up with the uh, English uh, chapel in the background, you know, did you notice that? Did you ever notice that? Church, doesn't, it looks nothing like any church that this congregation worships in. Because the, the window was made in England, and so they designed <laughs> a church that looks like a little English chapel out in the countryside there. So uh, he's, he's taking communion in the orchard, right? Because the church is being used for a smallpox hospital. So you see, from the beginning, there was some sense that the church had some connection, I believe, to health and wholeness and providing in a very intimate way for the health of people in the community. Now, some people might think, you know, we were a hospital for the Revolutionary War soldiers, but no, these were community people who were sick. In 1899, um, the South Street Church, okay, that was not that congregation met uh, and were concerned about um, the intoxication, particularly of husbands, of uh, women who were in a Bible study that the church was doing. Apparently, the downtown must have been just chock a block with lots of bars. Oh, it still is. <laughs> <laughs> we seem not to be as concerned about intoxication, I don't think, as they were when they met with these women who, you know, quite seriously were concerned about how their um, husbands were faring. And so they began the Market Street Mission. Hmm. That long ago. That long ago. <laughs> and it was done by the session of the South Street Church. This was not by an individual or just those group of women, but the session 
of the South Street Church. And the session had women on it at that time? No. Oh, no, 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 no. No women. No, the women did the work. Oh. <laughs> right? I mean, think of that up. Whoa. They, went, they went to do the um, um, Italian mission. They're the ones meeting with the women. They're the front. And I could, uh, I, I believe, this is, I believe that the women of the Presbyterian Church, including PW, have been at the forefront of mission from the very beginning, and really are the ones who have carried it forward and most creatively and courageously. So we could talk more about that sometime. So, <clears throat> Market Street Mission. What else about, else about uh, health and wholeness? Soup kitchen. I used What's to that? go to a soup kitchen in Dover. Did you? Yeah. It was pretty interesting. Was it at a church or not? I think You it need was. to tell me yes to make me feel good. Okay, I feel much better now. The soup kitchen opens. We didn't open the soup kitchen. And I know it's not called a soup kitchen, but that's what it was at that. Uh, I know that's what it's not called now. But it was then. It was open at St. Peter's. St. Peter's. It was open at St. Peter's Church. And they were the ones that pushed forward. But immediately, the Presbyterian Church in Morristown was engaged there, <coughs> both financially and with volunteers. And then when it moved up to Redeemer, um, the same has become true. I know Julie is, has something to do with that <laughs> as it's emerged. It's quite amazing, isn't it, to see how some of these things have both changed the community. I think we need to admit that and also change themselves in terms of seeing the scope of what they're called, what they're called to do and how, <clears throat> how the church has intersected with that. Um, <clears throat> in the late 80s, we had a lot of problems with many youth in the church who were in need of drug rehabilitation. Uh, <clears throat> the result of that was parents coming and saying the church needed to kind of stand up for um, um, healthy ways of being in the world and not using drugs. So um, the result was um, the creation of a week-long, I don't know if any of you will remember, a week-long emphasis on drugs and addiction. And Craig's mom was one of the key leaders of that whole, you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Um, the drug counselor at Morristown High School was the guest preacher in the single worship service. You know, then we were having two worship services. And he preached, not well, <laughs> but he preached. So this is just to emphasize that the church was paying attention to the health and well-being, not just of kids, not just of kids, but really the whole congregation and the whole community. And by doing that, um, I think really did change a lot of attitudes toward what needed to happen. So that that was quite an undertaking. Um, and there were there were events for that entire week, by the way. And then uh, I, I want to mention the reaching out to those with AIDS and HIV. And this was when Marnie was involved with that George Granby's um, new, new Beginnings, thank you. Um, and um, 
how that needed to really be kind of fought for um, in, in Morristown. And the church was at the forefront of fighting for George Brandy and New Beginnings and supporting his work. These were people within communities who were needing to be treated and welcomed as well. What I'd like to do is to invite you now to maybe just spend some time around your tables and talk for just a, about five minutes about what this stirs up in you about where the church is now in being concerned for health and wholeness in the community. Can you do that? Um, just if you're if you're out in the hinterlands, you can you can come you can choose a table. <laughs> and you both are you all are welcome to also talk online. I wish that I could hear you all. Otherwise, I would join the conversation with you guys too. I'm so sorry. We're gonna get we're gonna get out, right, Rich? It's gonna be, it's gonna happen. At some Yeah. Um, 
to realize without easily speaking about it in those words, there are lots of broken systems in our community. Um, the people can't get the housing they need and they want. They can't get the food they need and want. They can't get the support they need and want. So here are a few. Skeep was 1974. Skeep was out across a community center in Newark. Uh, Skeep stood for Suburban Cultural Educational Enrichment Program. 15 kids were bused every Tuesday to the church from Newark for individual tutoring and a meal and um, um, arts and crafts and recreation. <clears throat> What this is recognizing is there's something wrong here. These kids are in the middle of Newark and they're not getting what they need. And so there was an identification that 
we out here in the burbs had life uh, quite a bit better than these kids had in the inner city north. So Skeet went on for many years. I, I don't actually know what sort of sent that, but I think it was something unpleasant, is it my recollection? Uh, in the 60s, the church was involved with forming two organizations. This, I think, also in response to the riots in Newark uh, in the 60s. Presto stood for Presbyterian Tutoring Organization. This is also after the merger of the two school districts here, the Morristown and the Morris Township. Does anybody remember when those came together? Very controversial. They were court ordered uh, in the state. It was a very uh, controversial time. Um, but this was, um, uh, and that's what, you know, that out of that resulted a lot of the busing that goes on with kids and how areas are identified for schools. So uh, Presto was really reaching out, having the church reach out to kids in need in this particular period of time. More Help was really founded by Bob Schmidt, who was associate pastor at the church. And Bob um, uh, was part of an organization that said, you know, we need to work to bring kids together in our community in a different kind of way. And the emphasis was on kids who were just a couple years younger than they could what, uh, be able to get. They were like 14. Oh, okay. They, they couldn't get working papers. And um, the goal was to have um, white kids and African American kids primarily. The, Hispanic Latino population was not strong in Morristown at that time, of course. And they worked uh, and got paid, a kind of community organization thing. So they would work on uh, parks, playgrounds, that kind of thing. Um, and they were funded by churches, this church substantially, as well as businesses. They, they support me, um, who was here then. Warner, I'll give all these names that don't exist, at Warner, Lambert, Exxon, um, they were here. Bell Labs, <laughs> that seems funny to even say that name. But. So that was what the church was doing. Um, security loans. The Fair Housing Council of Morristown set up a, a loan program to assist people who needed an apartment but couldn't afford the security deposit. Um, they found that was really prohibiting housing occurring for a lot of people who were um, poor. And so the church, in a sense, invested along with others in this loan program and eventually began to get interest payments from that. Um, but it was an understanding of there's some things that really aren't fair that are going on here. Uh, of people being able to be housed where they need to be. And that there are these economic uh, barriers put up. Now we understand, because we're probably better friends with the landlords than those who are in that. We understand why those things are there, right? Because people misuse space. We get it. But if you're on the other side and you're trying to get out of where you are and house your kids in a good space, this looks like a terrible barrier. So this provided a way for you know, both the landlord to be treated fairly and to provide a way forward. But there was some kind of system broken 
here, right? We got to understand it. And the, Tom, and the discrepancy right now has just gotten worse. I'm sure. I drive around Morristown and I don't know where I am anymore. <laughs> That's the truth. I mean, you, what, what can you get in downtown Morristown? You can't, you can't buy a shoelace, right? <laughs> you see your investment counselor. But that's about it. Clothing Bank. Clothing Bank started at Church of the Redeemer uh, in the basement, dark little basement. <coughs> And then they sort of ran out of folks and reached out for more people to come help. And women from the church of the Presbyterian Church of Morristown, particularly Elizabeth Clark and Bernice Bainton, were people who uh, worked in organizing the clothing bank. Um, eventually, um, they retired from their position. And that's when Jan Harris came in to that and um, brought a whole new vision, I think, too, of not just providing clothing, but really deeply knowing the people who were there and uh, having this be a deep ministry in her life and the church's life. And again, particularly women of the church. Um, eventually, Redeemer kind of got tired of it, I think, and said, you know, why don't you all go somewhere else? And uh, that's when, and I, maybe others of you remember, I, I like, how did we do that exactly? I don't know. Um, he went and said, you know, could there, is there space down there in that, that basement of the parish house? And that's how um, things began to emerge there. And again, this is pointing to the fact of there are people in this community where clothing matters hugely, hugely, um, who can't get clothing for themselves. What's wrong with this system here? But it's addressing that problem. It's not answering the question, but it's addressing that problem. And Morris Shelter. See, I got there, Dick. Um, <laughs> Morris Shelter. We were invited to um, be um, the host of the Morris Shelter. Uh, we explored lots of different ways we could do it, and it ended up on the second floor. The back side of what's now, we didn't call it Howard House, we called it Old Man's Feet. Um, back side of the first floor, which was the sort of entry point, and then they went up back stairs and used the two, the, the two bedroom areas on the second floor. Um, the, um, um, sort of what's that, like the east and the north, I guess. And then they used the kitchen and we had uh, people provided, donated soup and, uh, and um, it, they, they could house, I think about 15 people, men and women, women in one room, men in the other. And now of course, Homeless Solutions is a giant uh, organization that does amazing things and honored you all this past year. But again, it was a trying to address a system that was broken, that there were people simply living outside. And that was wrong. And we needed to try to deal with this critical problem. Um, and, and fortunately, they were able to move into um, housing, so families and children. So that was amazing. Um, so here are the three areas that I've seen the church, um, part of its DNA in a way. Well, are there things about broken systems that you want to comment on? 
town, one of the other things that the church was instrumental in was an organization called Community Corrections Council. Well, Dick, I, I, I was going to say something about that, too. Thank you for doing it, though. I really appreciate that. Well, talk about yes. broken systems. It, that it really fits in that category. Yes, exactly. Um, and the, the church housed the offices toward the end of its active life, although it continued through, see, Dick, through people like you. Yes. 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 And being um, advocates for spiritual um, and emotional support for people in our jail. Don't forget that I took my cello with you to the jail. They would never have let us do that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and periodically, I would go. In the jail used to be up on you know, what's that street there? Uh, Western Ave. No, no. the and, next one is a bank. What is it? Bank Street. Bank Street. No. Bank and no. Where? I don't, you know, it's somewhere up there. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I, I do worship services there, and I got Marnie to come with me. And, and she, let me tell you what my husband said. As I was leaving, he said, um, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned. And I said, well, I'm going with Tom. And he said, so? <laughs> <laughs> What's his point, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I think about that so often. It was wonderful. And we were in this little crowded space doing a worship experience, and Marty would play. I always remember he played something one time, and, and this guy came up to you and said... It was Bach, and he said, I love Bach. Oh. An oh. inmate. Oh. And yeah. he said, I love Bach. Yeah, I can see that guy actually to this day. But you, Tom, there's another story about that. We took in the in the new jail, we took the church choir there, yes. and I'll never forget Joe Potter. You know, on the way in, and now there'll be you know bars separating us, won't there? I said, no, Joe, we'll all be in the same Space. area. Yeah. So she was really anxious about that. Well. I think the choir got like three standing ovations. And on the way out, Joe said to me, can we do this again sometime? Oh. Yeah, but it is, I see it, this is, that is an exact example, Dick, of an individual like yourself, um, keeping steady with the church's commitment to deal with broken systems and continue to provide for chaplaincy in the jail. Because that's what this was, was all about. And you know, a lot of people don't want to do chaplaincy, uh, you know, provide for chaplaincy in the jail, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even my father, you know, I would say, oh, I'm going to go do worship in the jail. My father then would say, why? Mm -hmm. What are you doing for the victims? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that was another question, mm -hmm. isn't it? So. And, and you know, initially for the, the gift bags that we do at Christmas time, earlier on people used to say, "Well, why would you want to give them gifts?" Exactly. We do not very do that powerful. at all anymore. In fact, we get very good support from all it's the local area churches. It's it's powerful. So we're at nine forty-five, and my boss boxes <laughs> this. I can tell she's trying not to look. My way, but this is you looking at me. We need to conclude, and I want to thank you for your degrading conversation. Don't forget to put some things up there. If you're feeling called to be engaged, and we'll get those to the right person. See all those little pieces of paper? I gave you different sizes. Did you notice that? Because I thought some people will just say yes. <laughs> so do that. Okay, we're there. We could go on for a long time on this one. Thank you all. Thank you so much. This was so wonderful. We're so grateful to have you here today. Thanks. Fabulous. Next week we have Nate from Co Home joining us, and Marty will be here to present him. I will not be here next week. It's actually Woody's birthday, and I was like, okay, I'll give you a Sunday off. So he will not. I will not be here, but Marty will be here to introduce him.
them. So I think I think one of the wonderful things about having Nate and his wife Julie with us, they are very um, what I want to say, very uh, committed conservative Jews. And mm -hmm. I, I think he was very pleased to be asked to come and talk to us. And I said, I want as many people in our church to know about Cohom as possible. And um, he just accepted immediately. So I think it will be really, and he also returned from Israel about a week before. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Marty, for making that connection and bringing him. But thank you all for being here today. We'll see you soon. Worship. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Hey, Nikki, it's good to see you. I can't hear you, unfortunately. My sound is working, but I'm glad you could be here.